I was reading today, and if you want to turn there, we can. I've been reading here for about two weeks now on Psalms, and and uh, and uh, we're going to open up in Psalms 37, because uh, Psalms is one, is one of those books that uh, is really loaded with wisdom, but a lot of people, just because the Psalms, they kind of, you know, when I got nothing to do, I read a Psalm. When I got nothing to do, I read a Proverbs, you know, and but Psalm has got a lot of instruction here, especially Psalm 37, that if we follow, if we follow what God tells us to do, everything will be okay. The problem is that we read the word, but we want to do our own thing, and that doesn't work. That has never worked. If that works so well, then what are we doing here? Because <laughs> we tried that before and it didn't work. So, uh, in saying all that, let me say this right here. I had a dream last night that it was, and I'm not going to share the dream, but it was so real, and it was about the church. It was so real, I walked straight up, and I had to ask God, what is this? It was, it was very, very, I could see Everything, everybody, I can remember faces, I can remember everything, and uh, I think God is getting ready to do something. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think God is getting ready to do something in the church, especially for those who are willing to obey and move with him. What do you mean, AC? Here's the thing. The church at large is really making a lot of converts. A lot of people are, you know, coming to the Lord and all that other stuff, you know, and just, and just, and, and a convert, we talked about this before, a convert is not the same thing as a disciple. It's two different things. You become a convert before you become a disciple. Okay, you, 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 you give your heart to Jesus, like Adolfo did a couple weeks ago. Right? Hallelujah. You give your heart to Jesus. You become a convert. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, I understand that it's not by my power, that it's God's power. And you start learning about Jesus. The problem that I see that the church has done is that they have, okay, you're a convert, Adolfo, that's good. Good enough. But Jesus specifically and explicitly said, go make disciples of others. He didn't say go make converts. He said go make disciples of others. Why is a disciple? See, we need to put all this together. Why does Jesus want us to be disciples instead of converts? It's a, it's a question that needs to be asked. Because without knowledge, you are powerless to move in the kingdom of God. You're totally powerless. So we need to have that knowledge of what it means to be what. We all want to have the power. We all want to be able to pray for things and see them done. We all want, you know, like Bert did this morning. But the problem is that we pray amiss because we don't understand a lot of things. Right? That's the problem. We pray amiss. Not that we want to pray amiss. We pray amiss because we do not understand. And this is where wisdom needs to come in. This is where understanding comes in. Understanding come in, comes in by persevering with the Word of God and following after the Word of God and doing that which the Word of God says. And when you start doing that which the Word of God says, then you become a disciple. Because a convert is just going to come on Sundays. And every once in a while they'll come on a Tuesday. But the rest of the week they're like, there's not a lot of reading. There's not a lot of praying. There's not a lot of connection with God. I don't have a problem with that. That's, that's to each his own on that one. But you will never be powerful in the things of God if that's all the God that you're getting. That's all. All you're going to get is you put little in, you get little out. You pay little, you get little. You pay nothing, you get nothing, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. You get what you pay for. So too much is given, much is required. Yes, of course. But there is a reason for that. 
He requires of you much when he gives you much so you can do much. Okay? This is so you can do much. My wife and I have been doing this for years. I don't question her. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm secure. She's secure in the Lord. I don't question what Rosemary this morning said to me, look, go ahead and go to church. I want to stay here and pray a little longer. I don't question that. I got on my truck and came. Uh, honey, is something wrong? No, no, I don't have to know that. That's between her and God. See, I want you all to be between you and God, not between you, me, and God. This is what it's all about. This is about you and God, not you, me, and God. Yes, there's safety on council. Yes, that we're supposed to assemble ourselves together. Yes, all these things are true. But, but listen, every relationship that you have is between you and God. Not between you, your husband, and God. It's you and God. Your husband cannot save you. Your wife cannot save you. Your children, your parents cannot save you. The only one that can save you is the one that died on the cross for you, and everything is between you and him. A pastor, I don't care how famous they are, can save your soul. How eloquent, how well-spoken, how funny. I mean, they come in all kinds of flavors out there. All you got to do is turn on the TV, you see the flavors. And you can pick and choose the one you want. Right? But let me tell you this, the only thing that is able to save your soul is your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. That's the only thing that can save your soul. This engrafted word of God right here, the Bible says that. It's able to save your soul. So if it's able to save your soul, doesn't it make sense that we need to be reading more about this right here and doing more of it? I mean, does that not make sense to me? Is that the engrafted word of God is able to save your soul. Does that not mean that we should be reading and understanding the word of God? I'm not talking about just while you're here on earth. I'm talking about eternal. I'm talking about saving of the soul. I'm talking about going beyond a short period of time that we're here on earth. Now to us, because we are finite beings, we think 70 years is a long time, 80 years. Not, you know, Senator McCain died yesterday, 81 years old. So you think, boy, he lived a long life. Compared to eternity, he lived a speck. We gotta be real, we got to be real about this right here. We're not doing this for this here and now. We're doing this for here now and forever. That's what God is looking for. I, I want to see people like my son that were willing to give it all for here, now, and forever. See, Jesus did what he did, not just so we can do it for here and now. Jesus did what he did so we can be with him forever. If we're only doing it for a short period of time, guys, while we're here, we're missing everything that he's trying to do. And there was, other, there was others that saw this right here, and they understood David was one of them. Psalms 37 is, is, David, is a David psalm. And in Psalm 37, David is analyzing, if you will, how we should approach the Word of God. That's what he's doing. He's, he's analyzing. He says, whoa, let me look at this right here. Let me read a little bit. Okay, Psalm, Psalm 37, says verse 1. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do, wrong, who do wrong. Do not worry about the wicked. And you see it in today's, it's prevalent. They're taking away anything that is of God. Now it's almost taboo to talk about it. And everything that used to be taboo to talk about, now it's okay to talk about it. Right? So it's kind of flipped over. Oh, you're against freedom of speech? No, I'm not against anything. I, I, the only thing that I'm interested in, guys, is this right here. That's it. I'm not interested. You know, the world does what it does. I'm not concerned with the world, but that's what David's saying. Hey, look, if you're worrying about what the evildoers are doing and because they have more than you do and they seem to be living a lavish lifestyle and they're doing, you know, remember the guy died too this week, the guy, rich and famous guy. They used to do, have that show. 
Life of the Rich and Famous. He used to have a show for a long, long time. And people watched that show all the time because they wanted to see how the rich and the famous lived. Well, you know what? They lived and now they're gone. And nobody knows who they were anymore. They're in the dirt like everybody else. Don't look at the rich and famous. Don't look at the wicked. Keep your eyes on God. You can't keep your eyes on both of them. One will rob the other. God will rob you from looking at the rich and famous because he wants to watch over you. And the rich and famous will rob you because they just want to rob you. That's the difference. That's the reason they got rich and famous. <laughs> it was hard work. Yeah, you know what? A lot of those guys work hard at taking your money somewhere or another. They work very hard at it. Don't kid yourself. How do you think they become millionaires and billionaires? If I can figure out how to get this thing down like this, they're going to put this, they're going to put that. Next thing you know, I got this much. Oh, that worked. Let's do it in a bigger scale. And that's how they become richer and more famous. So David is very clear. He said, wait a minute. Don't look at it because you can't see God when you're looking at them. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. I mean, he is making everything sort of like in comparison here. Look at it. Look at it. See if I'm, David's saying, see if I'm wrong. Remember those kings that were back there? They're gone. Remember Saul? He used to be my king. That's what David is saying there. And now Saul's gone. What's going on? People don't even talk about Saul. Now they talk about me. So see, that's the whole thing. We, need, we can't look at both. And then verse 3. And here we need to start. This is what, this is what David is saying. This is what we need to start working on this. Thing. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. It's not just trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord is good, but that's not what he said. He said, trust in the Lord and do good. Virgo just said it. That woman that was at the cashier's register. Everyone, thank God for these people in this country, to be honest with you, because most people in America do have a good heart. Evil is everywhere. But most people in America do have a good heart. So trust in the Lord and do good. Then, when you do these two things together, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. But you will not live in the land safely and prosper if you don't trust in the Lord and do good. Does, does anybody ever look at the, at, at, at the word backwards to see what, what would happen if I don't do that? Because that's what I do. That's what makes me do the word of God. I always look at the flip side of the corner and go, okay, so if I don't do that, because I'm lazy, so if I don't do that, I go, okay, well, I don't like that. I don't like that outcome, so I better do what it says here. I mean, it's not, it's not, this is, thank God, this is Bible for dummies, you know, because I need this kind of, kind of teaching. I need, I need for God to show me so my lazy self won't try to retrieve back to the way I used to be. That's the carnal nature. All of us do that. That's in all of us. Verse 4. Everybody likes this one here, but do we, do we understand what it says? Take delight in the Lord, or King James said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the, the, uh, the desires of your heart. New Living Translation says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Take delight in the Lord. What does that mean? Take delight in the Lord. The one time? Oh, Jesus, come. I, I love you, Jesus. And you have this emotional thing and you just want to hug the cross. And that's it. No. Take delight in the Lord is a continuous thing that you continue to do day after day, night after night. This is what gives you strength throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your month, throughout your life. You need to continue to delight yourself in the Lord. You can't stop delighting yourself in the Lord. And what happens is, as you delight yourself in the Lord, is that your heart's desires start changing a little bit. That doesn't mean he doesn't give you what, those little things. But he's not going to spoil you rotten. I'm going to tell you that right now. 
He's not going to do that because he's not that kind of father. He's a good father. So if you delight yourself in the Lord and you continue to delight yourself in the Lord, you're going to make adjustments because you love him and you're putting him first. That's, that's what delighting means. You are pliable. Delighting means you're pliable. You're letting God do those things that he wants to do in your life. And as you become pliable to God and he starts moving you around, all of a sudden the things that you thought you needed, you realize, I really don't need that. I need more of him. And the more you get of him, the more of these other little things just kind of start clicking in. All of a sudden, the finances just like, no, I don't need that, but that'll work just right, just good right there. And little things start clicking in. And, and, and all of a sudden, your children start seeing a softer side of you that is not like a bear every time they see you coming in the door. For lack of better words, it's like, wait till your dad gets home. How would you like it if I tell you, guys, wait till God gets home? <laughs> you know, everybody be going, oh, no. <laughs> right? Because we all fall short. So everybody be going, oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't let him come. Well, yeah, he needs to come. So it's not like that. that when you start delighting in him, you start seeing the good things about him. You start seeing how wonderful he is. You start seeing how faithful he is. You start seeing how loving he is. You start seeing these other things, and then the desires of your heart start changing. No longer do you want to be a man of flesh or a woman of flesh. All of a sudden, you want to be a spiritual person. You start becoming like a disciple. You don't think Peter, James, John, Paul, you don't think those people changed? My goodness, Paul was a murderer. He persecuted the church. He was going from house to house, taking people out of the house, and either getting him stoned to death because he was right there when, when Stephen got stoned, or throwing him in the lions. He persecuted the church. He wanted the Christian church to be done away with. He delighted himself in the Lord. I mean, he knew this psalm right here better than I can explain it. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul knew the law up and down and everything that David, Ezekiel, anybody ever wrote. He knew everything left and right, up and down. He knew everything perfectly. Yet, he persecuted the church. Oh, they're wrong. They're wrong. They're all wrong. It's got to be this way. The stupidest thing that a man can do any man is to think he knows it all. Hello. That's the stupidest thing a man can do. And yet, we got people in our government that way right now. <laughs> and we've always had them, I guess. And Paul was one of those guys. He thought he knew it all. All of a sudden, you know, the Lord himself had to come in because the Lord knew what he was going to have. See, he knows your heart. And Paul, in his wrong ways, delighted himself in the Lord as good as he knew how. He did. He delighted himself in the law. He wanted to obey God. And he, he, uh, he didn't care how many enemies the, uh, the, that the Lord had. He wanted to do away with all the enemies of God. The only thing is that he didn't know how to do it, and he thought that the way he was doing it was the correct way. And then God says, no, Paul, that's not the correct way. If I need to do that, I can just explode this earth that I created, <laughs> you know, and you with it. So I, I don't have to do that, but there is a better way. Love. See, God shows love and mercy even towards his enemies. That's the only chance we got. So let, let us not be stupid, okay? Let us move on and, and, and try to learn from God. and come Everything you do, the hit, verse 5. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Commit everything to him. What does it mean? What's the word commit mean? Commit. Are we committed? Are we committed to this gospel? Are we committed to the church? Are we committed to live a, a holy life? Are we committed to live a wholesome life? Are we committed to help others? Are we committed to love others like God loved us? Are we committed to do these things? Because we need to be, if we want to get answers from God, if you want to live a better life, if you want your children to have a good life, you need to be committed. Not half committed. It doesn't say half commit yourself to every. 
No, it doesn't say that. It says commit your ways. Commit your life. Why are you saying that? Because you want us to be committed to the church. I I want you to commit to to the church. I don't care if it's this church. I want you to be committed to a church. To the church of the Lord. Don't necessarily need to be this one here. I'm glad you're here. But the commitment is to, to the heart of God. And when you commit something, that means you have laid it down in the throne of God and God owns it from here on out. And that means your family, that means your jobs, that means your bank account, that means everything. When you commit yourself to God, that means it's committed. No longer do you worry about it. God is in control. We have a problem. We commit things to God, or so we say, but we still worry about it. Is that working out? It doesn't work out. When you commit something to God, you need to leave it there. Oh, I see. You you sound like you don't do that. Yeah, I do that. The problem is that I do do that. (laughs) I committed you all guys to to, to God, but still I worry about some of you at times. I'm no different. I'm a man of flesh and bone just like everybody else in here. I have flaws and faults and problems that I need to overcome myself. I have committed this church and everything in it over to God, but still at times I find myself worrying about what's going on in people's personal lives. Not that I'm nosy, nor I want to be. I really don't want to know anything about it. But I worry if they're not walking with God like they should. Because I know the outcome of that kind of relationship with God. If you say you know God and then you're going to walk away from God whenever you feel like it, what if God did, for you, did that to you when you need him? He just walked away from you. Well, you know, Kathy, I'm just using a fictitious name. I ain't got time for this right now. I got, other, I got bigger things to, to do. But, 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 but I, got, I got bigger things to do. I need to go to the store. I need to go pay that bill. I need to go get my son. I need... We can't do that. It's commit yourself to the Lord. Commit your ways. Commit everything to him. Yes, Kim, your job. I know Kim's committed, so there's a reason I can pick on her. Commit. Commit means be steady, be true to it. Don't just say you're going to commit. It's better for you not to say that you're going to commit than to say you're going to commit and then don't do it. Because God's watching. God's watching. And and let me tell you something. I've been... been, you know, we have prayer meetings here on Friday nights at 7 o'clock if you don't want to join us. And uh, we have a good prayer meeting Friday night, I'd say. And, uh, and one of the things that I've been pondering since Friday night, people say, you, all you think about is this stuff here, AC? Don't you, know, you, don't you have a job? Yeah, I got, I got, I got a job. I got a business. But I do think about this all the time. I really do. I can't help it. But there is a time where there's things that we do not understand why they take place in our lives the way they do. Marvin right now is one of those things. We all love Marvin and Irene. And there's other things that we don't understand. And our soul cries out. I know my wife and I have talked about this before. And our soul cries out, when are we going to get some of these answers? When are we going to see this happen? I've been asking God some serious questions about that stuff. And there is such a thing as the night of the soul. That means your, your, your soul is like, it doesn't see clearly. It doesn't see, it doesn't see bright like, like when the sun's out. That's what it means, the night of the soul. And what happens is that we as humans try to have an answer when God is the answer. 
and we try to figure it out, and we try to make God, this is, this is how silly we are, and sometimes your grant us because he loves us, we try to make God answer us in a certain specific time and way. God doesn't have to answer anybody. Just remember who he is. He is God. When the time comes, you need the answer, all of a sudden you go, wow, that was there all along. But the thing is, for us, is to persevere. That's what faith is. If every time you, you, you ask for anything at all, God just did, like, how would you grow? God, is not, God won't allow it. God is going to watch over us. And when something we want is not what he knows we have to have, he will not allow us to have it. Why? Because he loves us. That's why. Because he knows it's going to hurt you down the road. I'm saying this to you young parents because don't fall into that trap. I see this happen a lot with divorced parents too, that the kids all of a sudden become very, very persuasive one side against the other to get what they want. It's amazing how Satan can start teaching children from a little, little, with a little. He gets in there and like, mama ain't going to let you have it, but daddy will. Daddy won't let you have it, but mama will. The next thing you know, they, they're bouncing around. They know it, what, you, what you're allowing them to do is learn how to get what they want one way or the other. And what happens when mom and daddy are not there? They're going to do the same thing out there. God forbid. But they'll do the same thing out there. Do we love our children? Yes, we do. I see. Well, they need to start doing what's right then. We need to start doing what's right. My daughters will tell you, hey, I gave Rachel a lot of stuff. But I didn't give her everything. She'll tell you. There was a time she used to ride horses. I used to drive all the way to Alpharetta or Rosemary, Rosemary, Rosary. Every week we used to drive her all the way to Alpharetta so she could take her lessons. And then all of a sudden she said, I want to take guitar lessons. I said, really? I said, all right, you want to take guitar lessons, baby? I said, you need to, you need to choose horses or guitars. Because my daddy ain't paying for both. Okay, Dad, I'll, I'll take the guitar lessons, okay? Let's grab the horses, let's go to the guitar lessons. I'm not doing both. Sometimes God will do that. What's it going to be? I'm not doing both. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a teaching moment that we all need to learn. If he gave me everything, guys, I'll be the rich and famous. <laughs> Hello? Because everybody wants to be rich and famous. Don't kid yourself. Your flesh wants to be rich and famous. I don't care what you say. Everybody wants to have a bank account that a camel can go through. Right? Everybody wants to have a huge bank account, so they think that because they got a huge bank account, they don't have nothing to worry about. Classroom, and they'll realize real quick, if I had 29 kids in my, or 20 kids in my house, there's no way I can teach them all right. Right? I mean, I, I mean, common sense will tell them that immediately. If I got 18, 20 kids in my house living with me, there's no way I can take care of all 20 of them and teach them right. All they have to do is just look. That's not the teacher's responsibility. This is the parent's responsibility. You bore these children. It's up to you to teach them the right way. Teach, see, it goes back to they get away from the Bible. They get away from the Bible. They got away from the Bible altogether. Instruct the child in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it. The problem is, if you don't instruct the child in the way they should go, then they will depart from it. If you're not doing any instructing, the child doesn't know. And the ways of the Lord are lost, at least to the child. So now you guys got the children? Start. Start. All right. Time went by quickly. Berto, it's your fault. <laughs> commit, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him. Trust him, not man, not yourself. Trust him, and he would help you. See, a lot of time we put too much trust in ourselves and our ability to get things done. Trust him, and he would help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday. That's when you're in trials. This, into, this is another one, verse 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord. 
we as a people cannot be still to save our lives. We can't be still. It's almost like in our minds race. I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. And God says, be still. Hush your mouth. Hush your thoughts. Be still. Let me speak to you. We do all the speaking, and we don't let him speak to us. What is that? We are his children. We're the, we're, you know, we are, we are the sheep of his pasture. Right? It'd be like, we're talking about schools, right? It'd be like all the children are telling the teacher what they thought or what they think they ought to be teaching. It's the same thing. We telling God, and we don't shut up. We just keep on just spewing junk out there. And God says, and I wonder sometimes, how long, Lord? How long will you put up with this right here? Because now that we're Christians, now we know it all. Hello. Now we're all Christians. Now we know it all. No, we don't. He knows it all. Why don't you be still in the presence of God? If your mind starts racing away with something else, speak to your mind. In the name of Jesus, be still. And it may not work today, and it may not work tomorrow, but the more you start speaking to your mind to be still, sooner or later, the mind is going to stand still and wait on God. You've got to wait on Him. It doesn't say he's going to wait on us. We got to wait on him. Be still. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Oh, no, we need to have it done right now. What's this word patiently mean? I don't want it. God, can you strike that word patiently out of the Bible? Help us out, please. See, we start talking to him. Patiently. Wait patiently on him to act. You got problems today? Word of advice. Wait patiently on him to act. You don't have to have it this. Listen, if you needed to have it, it was the life or death situation. If you needed to have it today, he will make it happen today. He's God. He can do it. Was he not the one that said, let there be light? And there was life. See, we need to, do we believe God or not? <laughs> I mean, I need to go to some of the big churches. Do people believe in God or not? Because the, the same God that said, let there be light, it's the same God that's speaking to us now and saying, look, wait patiently upon me, and I'll make things happen when they need to happen, not when you want them to happen. Susan, how the devastating, this is how quickly God can work. She had, her husband had a devastating report last week. Or the week before, wasn't it? Two weeks ago. Cancer. Was it kidney? No, uh, bladder. Bladder cancer. Devastating. She's like, oh. She put it before the Lord. Then went for another test. What, this last week? Thursday. No cancer. Listen, God knows how to perform it, when to perform it, and why perform it. We need to quit thinking God's small, God is big. We need to quit thinking God won't because God will. See, we always look at the negative instead of looking at the positive. The coin's got two sides, but we always look at the side that's going to put us down. And God wants to bring us up. You know, people tell me all the time, he said, what if you pray for somebody, people who don't come here to church, you know, my friends and stuff like that. What if you pray for somebody and they don't get healed? I tell them, that's not my job. What if they do get healed? Hello, what's, what's the difference between one and the other? My job is to pray. God's job is to do what the prayer says. And when the time comes, he'll do it right. I believe in the, I believe in the positive 50 instead of the negative 50. Because it's a 50-50 chance. Right? I believe in the positive 50. I believe that my God is more than willing and able to do that which is right for us. 
So what does it mean that God loves Susan more than he loves us? No. God wants us to live right. Listen to this verse right here, because it goes back, uh, the, the rest of seven says, Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Let me read verse 1 again. That's verse 7. Don't worry about wicked or envy those who do wrong. It's the same thing. Why is he repeating it? Because too many times we do that. Too many times we take our eyes off our God and start talking about and looking at the people who got more than we got. It's not right that A.C. lives up there in top of that hill and it's got that nice house in the old truck. Well, that wasn't up to A.C., that was up to God. God is the one that made those things happen. Listen, you guys, you young people are going to go through stages in your life and all of a sudden you're going to look back like I did and you're going to, how did I get here? How did this happen? It was God. It was God all along. It wasn't you. You were just a tool that he used to get you to where you're at. But it was him all along that did it. He was instructing you even when you thought, man, this hole looks, looks awful deep, and I still got this shovel in my hand, and I can't help myself. I keep digging. I've done that too. And it's almost it got to the point the guy said, okay, son, put the shovel down. You're going to bore a hole all the way through, but put the shovel down. And that's what you need to do. You need to just start listening to God when he speaks to you and do what he says. But the problem is, if I had learned these lessons when I was young, maybe I would be rich and famous. But, but I didn't learn them, and there was a reason for it, because I had to be here today for you guys. I had to do the will of God. But I can look back on my life right now and every job that I had, everything that I've done, all those things, I can actually see the hand of God moving me even when I didn't realize he was there. See, this is what happens when you get old. <laughs> this is what happens when you get old. All of a sudden, you start looking at stuff you never looked at before. You go like, hmm, I wonder how that happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how that happened. And there are things that we shouldn't have done that when we look back, it makes us ashamed that we did them. And let me tell you this right here. If you put them under the blood, don't let the enemy come dig them up again. Don't do that. Don't do that because the enemy, he is very good at reminding us how we failed yesterday and last year and three years ago and 20 years ago. The enemy is very good at reminding us of all these things. That is under the blood of Jesus. We need not bring it up. You got saved so those things will be removed from your life as far as the east is from the west. Okay, that's the reason you got saved. So when the enemy brings it up, and I know sometimes our minds do this. All of us. There's none here that can say, except maybe for the young, innocent ones, there's none here that can say, I, I, I played it perfect all the way. Not, no, none of us. Because if we did, we didn't need him. Right? Let's be honest. But we do need him. And we need him to continue to teach us. And we need him to continue to work with us. We need him to continue to encourage us. I'm here to tell you something. Be encouraged. God's got many things for you yet to do in your life. All of us here. Be encouraged. That dream that I had last night, I don't, know if it's a, I don't know if it's an encouragement or if it was a warning. I don't know which one it is, but God knows which one it is. I woke up and I said, God, what is this? Because sometimes we say, well, it was just a dream. Maybe you ate too much cabbage last night, A.C. Well, I did not. <laughs> I did not have cabbage. It was a dream that I know it was a dream from God. I don't have that many dreams that are that vivid. 
And it was about the church. And you know, I've always prayed, God, give me dreams. Every night when I go to bed, I say, God, please, I want to dream with you. But you know, you know what our mind wants to do? We want to jump around fluffy clouds and everything is beautiful and God's talking to us, you know, and everything is wonderful. That's what our minds want to go to. But sometimes God brings dreams where you go like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What is that? What is that? I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. He is bringing those people who are willing to hear him and are willing to become disciples into a next phase. I do believe that with all my heart. Kali, you're one of those. I believe that. He is willing, he is willing to do it as long as we step out on the ledge and say, I'm going to do it, God. But count the cost. Count the cost. Don't just, I'm going to do it, God, and all of a sudden you realize, ooh, I didn't know he meant that. Because that's exactly what will happen. You can't do that. you got to be able to put it all on his hands. Commit yourself to him. And everything you got, you got to commit to him. See, a lot of people I hear, I read books and stuff like that about living the crucified life and all that other stuff. Most people want to talk about the crucified life. Most people want to sing about the crucified life, but they don't want to live the crucified life. The crucified life means him first, everything else second. The crucified life means that I'm going to do everything. I'm going to spend every time I get a chance doing something for God. That's a crucified life. That's the life that Paul lived. But we all want to have the power of Paul and Peter and James and John that his shadow would heal people. Imagine that, walking down the street and your shadow will heal somebody. Adolfo needs a back healing. All of a sudden, I walk by here without him asking anything, and my shadow will heal his back. Imagine that. We want that. Do we not want it? But let me tell you, count the cost because those guys pay the price. Oh, we want it without paying the price, then it won't happen. Then it won't happen. If you still want to live in the flesh, you cannot live in the spirit. Romans 8 is very clear of that. You can't do both. Read Romans 8 and you'll see it. You live after the spirit, these things will happen. And I believe that the time is and the time is now where God is getting ready to unleash that power once again. I really believe it. I believe it with all my heart. God is ready to do these things once again for those who dare to believe. And you know what my cry is? God, help my unbelief that I may be able to act like you want me to act. That I might be able to do what you want me to do. That I might be able to say what you want me to say. And I might be able to love the ones that need to be loved. Come on, praise and worship. I can't finish this today. Remember this, though. I think it's in Matthew. It says, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. And many answer the call. Just because you answer the call, that doesn't mean you're chosen. It doesn't say that. And this is Jesus speaking. Many, this is about the king and the feast and all that other stuff right after that. He says, many are called, few are chosen. If you're a chosen of God, that means that you are willing to put it all on the line and walk with him regardless of the cost. But the call is still there. I mean, the call, they're still going to heaven. They still love the Lord. They're still saved by the blood of the Lamb. But the chosen ones are the ones that are going to do God's work, God's bidding. We need to remember that. Hallelujah. So if, you got, if you're discouraged... If you don't understand the darkness of your soul sometimes at night, because it's not that you're not saved, it's because you're just in a little bit of darkness, and you don't know how to get out of it because the Lord hasn't answered your prayers like you think He should, let's pray together. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, let's pray together. Hallelujah. If you got any need you want, you want God to do something or move in your behalf, let's bring it to Him. Like I said before, I am not the healer, but I know He is. I'm not the Savior, but I know He is. So we can make the introduction and go from there.
let's not stop because it's Sunday and service is over. Let's not go back to our old lives again. Let's live this this day. Let's start, let's try it today. Live the rest of this day for Him. I don't know what He got to lose. Was it that good before? Are you really losing anything? Let's live the rest of the day for Him. Let's let's meditate on Him. Let's. I know we're gonna have conversations. I know we're gonna have dinners. I know we're gonna have all these things. But let's meditate on Him throughout that. Let's just not stop because the service is stopped. Let's continue in Him. And let's create a habit of doing that. We'll be surprised at what He'll do in our lives. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, for, we thank you God, for your word, God, that is able, Father, to save our souls, God. As we apply this truth, God, to our lives, God, your word, Father, it will be like a miracle, God, running through our bodies, God, just healing everything, touching everything, making everything right that was wrong, God. Hallelujah. Most of all, God, your word, Father, will be an anchor to our souls, God. That we know, Father, that no matter what the tempest, no matter what the storms, no matter what the darkness, God, our souls are anchored in you, God. Hallelujah. Not because of anything that we've done or we deserve, but, Father, because of what Jesus did for us, God. Hallelujah. And, Father, you even told Thomas, God, blessed are those that without seeing, they believe. Help us not to ask for for proof, Father, for who you are, God. I don't need no proof of who you are. I know who you are, God. You don't need to prove yourself to me, God. I know you. I love you. Help us all, Father, to walk in that faith, God, that we all need to have, God. Without your son, we wouldn't have had it, God. Help us to rely on you, Father. Hallelujah. Every day. Help us, Father, to release those things that we still try to hold dear. And you keep whispering, let him go, let him go, let him go, so I can take care of him. Let us commit our ways to you, God, hallelujah, and everything in our lives, God. Teach us, God, not to look at the evildoers, God, but teach us, God, to look at that which is right, God, and do that which is right. Help us, God, and teach us to delight ourselves in you, God. Hallelujah, God. Desires of our hearts, let it be about you, God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let my desire, God, be all about you, God, and your kingdom and your grace and your knowledge and your love, Father. I want to be lost in your love, God, wholly and completely, God. Bless this service. Bless these people, God. Bless this day. We thank you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah.